If you wouldn't mind, uh, we're going to go to the book of Isaiah today. Uh, there's a number of things that I want to look at uh, in light of all the things that have happened. And as a leader, you know, you're going to have to recognize that, um, that, that sometimes you want to be able to make sure that you are the people that you are leading uh, don't fear. They don't have... Um, they don't have the, um, you know, capacity, and they don't have the desire to have their, um, to have their constituency, so to speak, um, you know, uh, they don't have the this constituency to go ahead and, and have, uh, you don't have your constituency in fear and panic, no matter what happens. You always have to look like you're in control, even if that means that you have to just trust God in the midst of it. Even if you have to tell them, let's just trust God. Okay? William Seymour, the prime example of this, in 1906, in April, um, he was praying 10 days straight. Uh, I think uh, like it was like the end of March into April. He was, he was praying, and God showed up. And... Um, uh, a gentleman who was living in the house, he started to pray with him, um, that the house that William Seymour was living in, and then people started to come to pray. And, um, and, and, and then they asked him to preach, and he started to preach on Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and we'll deal with that a little bit later, uh, not, maybe not today. And in this process, <clears throat> um, hundreds of people started to come to this house on Bonnie Bray Street, and they came into this house, and, and uh, there's different accounts. Uh, one said that, that William Seymour was preaching on the porch. Others said that he was preaching on the inside, and people gathered all over the outside into the street to hear what he had to say. Um, I tend to think it was the former one, where he, where he was standing on the porch, and people were around him, people were in the house and uh, when, they, when he was speaking. And then eventually the, the, the front of the house um, <clears throat> yeah, the porch of the house collapsed and, uh, and it couldn't do it anymore. It was just, you know, just collapsed and they had to move. And uh, William Seymour didn't really know what to do. He had $8. And he went down, he found this old horse stable, which used to be a mission church, uh, African uh, mission church. And, um, and then he ended up uh, renting it for $8 a month. And, uh, and that's how uh, Azusa Street actually came about that's when God started to pour out the miracles uh, people falling out six blocks away uh, healings creative miracles ears put back on I mean new ears coming uh, new legs new arms new teeth uh, things like that uh, he also did this as a as a black man in the middle of the Jim Crow era um, he was able to do this and people were honoring him and respecting him which was unheard of. And he was even walking the streets, um, and it was unheard of. So, you know, sometimes you're going to need the grace of God to, uh, to do things. I remember one story of his that he was uh, walking through L.A. at night, which, again, under Jim Crow, uh, you weren't allowed to. The, the, the African-American population was not allowed to be outside at night. And he just walked. The Lord told him to go to this house. He showed him exactly which house to go to. He went there, knocked on the door. This woman answers, and he said, I'm the one that you've been praying for. I'm the one that's here to bring re the revival that you've been praying for. And so she let him in, and, and uh, the rest is history. Um, so you have to understand that that God is doing something big, and God is doing some things bigger than than what you know what uh, the mainstream media is reporting, what churches somewhat sometimes are reporting, and even what um, uh, people are telling you and what's on social media. God is doing bigger things than that. Um, I want to tell you, you need we need to uh, not just you, but me too. We need to. We all need to. Um, um, look at some of these things. And first I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 5, and uh, I'm going to read some of it uh, in verse 8. It says, Woe to those who in their greed buy up house after house to make one grand estate until, until there is no place for anyone else. Only the landowner is left. 
Okay, so God is saying, woe to those who, uh, who in their greed buy up house to house. So that means that you can also, without greed, buy up house to house. Isn't that amazing? Okay, the other thing is, he says, woe to those, in verse 11, woe to those who start drinking early in the morning, lingering late into the night, and get drunk with wine. Their lavish parties are complete with the music of harps and flutes, and the wine flows. Yet they have no respect for what God has done. Uh, I know a lot of Christians that do that. They uh, even as well. They, uh, they, they don't have any respect for what God has done, nor do they contemplate the work of his hands. They're just partying. Okay. Uh, another thing he says here uh, in verse 16 says, With justice the Lord Yahweh, commander of angel armies, displays his greatness and righteousness, sets him apart as the holy God. Then lambs will graze as if in their own pastures, and the refugee will eat in the ruins of the rich. Okay? And then uh, this, this, in verse 18, it says, Woe to those who drag, behind them, uh, who drag behind them their guilt with ropes made of lies, straining and tugging, harnessing to their bondage. They say, May God hurry up and bring his judgment so that we can see it once and for all, and let the prophetic plan of the Holy One of Israel quickly come to pass so that we can see what it is. In verse 20, Woe to those who call good evil, uh, who call evil good and good evil, who replace darkness with light and light with darkness, who replace bitter with sweet and sweet with bitter. Isn't that America today? I'm talking November 6th. I think today is the 6th of November 2020. Isn't that today? They're calling evil good and good. It's okay to lie. It's okay to to um, it's okay to, uh, to to rob people of their money of their freedoms. Okay, that was set up years ago. That was working for many many years. Woe to those who call evil good. In other words, it's good to murder little babies. It's good to murder uh, the elderly. Well, we'll give it a name. We'll call it abortion and euthanasia. Infanticide is what it is. And genocide is what it is. Verse 21. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and see themselves as clever and shrewd. Not to, I'm not going to point anybody out here, but we see this in 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 in, um, in America today in the in the uh, exe in the um, uh, uh, not the judicial branch or the executive branch, but the uh, but the in the lawmakers in Congress and the Senate. Okay, we we see that in churches today. We see that in businesses today. They are wise in their own eyes, and they see themselves as clever and shrewd. I'm not going to call anybody out, but I just want to read these because what is what I'm going to talk about in a second is important. 22. Woe to the champion wine drinkers who are heroes in mixing strong drinks. Judges and politicians who acquit the guilty for a bribe and take away the rights of the innocent. Everybody talks about it's the right of a woman uh, to, for her own body. She gets to choose what she does with her own body. But what about the right of the innocent baby who's inside of her womb? It's a baby. Okay, we call it a fetus, which means little one. Okay? As if that's going to change the way they feel about it. It's a fetus. It's a little one. It's a little person inside that body that we abort. Now, if you did that to a whale... Man, people would get upset. But what about a baby? That's a human being. That's a soul. And, and some states even want to have it so that you can kill a baby outside of the womb. Apparently, um, you're no longer a fetus until, you know, you are still a fetus up until I think it's six hours after you're out of the womb. You're not. You're a baby. You've got, you've got a gender. You have a, a destiny. You have a purpose that God has placed inside of you 
from the moment of your conception, God already planned out your life of what you're supposed to do. And for convenience sake, America has legalized the very assassination of babies and the elderly. Therefore, just as verse 24 of chapter 5 of Isaiah, therefore, just as tongues of fire lick up the straw and dry grass, they will be destroyed just as a plant with decaying roots and blossom dries up with the dust and is blown away in the wind. For they said no to the teachings of Yahweh, the Lord of angel armies, and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. For this reason, Yahweh's anger burned against the people and he struck them down with his holy hand. The mountains trembled and the dead bodies were littered like garbage left in the streets, even with his anger. And even with this, his anger has not turned away and still his hand is heavy upon them. He will lift up a banner to signal to the distant nations. He whistles for them to come from the ends of the earth. Look, here they come, running swiftly and speedily. Not one warrior stumbles or grows weary not even stopping to rest, they are ready for battle. When God removes his protection from a nation, which is what we are in danger of at this moment, of shunning God, of, of shutting down uh, the First Amendment rights in the USA, the right to, to, to assemble, the right to uh, uh, have no longer have the um, government interfere with with the uh, assembling up together uh, uh, for religious purposes. The freedom of religion, we call it. Now, I'm a Christian, but that also includes, that also includes the Jews in the synagogue and includes uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, Islamic uh, Muslims in their mosques. Freedom of religion. And the government will not interfere with that. That's the First Amendment. And all these things are, you know, I, I believe all these things are in danger of being taken away. And in spite of all this, I'm going to go to chapter, um, I'm going to go here to chapter uh, 11 of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Okay. And I want to talk about this a little bit. Okay, I've got some time left. In chapter 11 of Isaiah, starting with verse 20, it says, The cut-off stump of Jesse will sprout, and a fruitful branch will grow from its roots. Um, a couple of years ago, we had uh, some devastating fires here in Redding, California, where um, you know I personally was uh, evacuated you know from places I was staying uh, no le no less than four times in one night and what happened there you know as I was walking back through because I, I would walk to work or I'd walk home from work I would get a ride to work but I would walk home from work and, um, and as I was walking uh, I would go by these places that had some felled trees and rotted trees and burnt and out of the rot, you can see flowers growing up out of it. It was incredible. Out of death, life was coming. Okay, and this, this stump out of Jesse will sprout and a fruitful branch will go. Obviously, he's talking about Jesus. You know, Jesus came from the line of Jesse, came from the line of David, who was the son of Jesse. And in verse 2, it says, The Spirit of Yahweh will rest upon him, the spirit of extraordinary wisdom, the spirit of perfect understanding, the spirit of wise strategy, the spirit of mighty power, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of the fear of Yahweh. And he will find his delight in living by the fear of the Lord. He will never, he will neither judge by appearances nor make his decisions based upon rumors. With righteousness, he will uphold the justice for the poor and defend the lowly, uh, defend the lowly of, the, of the earth. His words will be like a scepter of power that conquers the world. With his breath, he will slay the lawless one. Righteousness will be his warrior sash and faithfulness his belt. Okay? 
uh, just to share this a little bit, um, I had a vision one time of a um, of a, um, a scepter. It was up against a tree, and I asked the Lord if I could uh, if I could hold it. And the Lord said, "Well, it's yours, of course." So I, I, I grabbed the scepter, and um, and 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 you know, and you remember what a scepter is? It's the king's. Um, basically, he would hold it out. If he, if he wanted to see you, or if you came to see him, he would hold the scepter out to you. And when he gave it to you, that means he gave you his authority. There's other things about a scepter, but that's fair enough. Righteousness will be his warrior sash. You know, in, in those days, they, the warrior would wear a sash around and had righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness talks about in Ephesians 6. And faithfulness, his belt. Faithfulness. Verse 6. Then the wolf will be subdued and live with the gentle lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the gentle lamb. The young calf and the ferocious lion will be together. And as a shepherd drives his flock, a small child will guide them along. The cow and the bear will graze alongside each other. Cubs and calves will lie down together. Lions, the lion like the ox will eat straw. The nursing child will play safely near the rattlesnake's den and the toddler will stretch out his hand and shine light over the serpent. On my holy mountain of Zion, I love Zion. On my holy hand, a holy mountain of Zion, nothing evil nor harmful will be found. Now here it is. For the earth will be filled to the brim. The earth will be filled to the brim with the intimate knowledge of the Lord Yahweh just as water swells the sea. Or just as the waters cover the sea. And you can see in Jeremiah 31-34, Habakkuk 2-14, Hebrews 8-11 that the intimate knowledge of the glory of the Lord. In other words, not just not just knowledge, but experiential knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Hi, Kim. And it's like this. You have to recognize that God is bigger than all of this. In in in, uh, in Isaiah 9 it says uh, it says that and the government will be upon his shoulders. Okay, I want to read that because in the Passion Translation, it's really, really powerful. I'm going to read it. He says this. He says, um, A child has been born for us. A son is given, verse 6 of chapter 9. The responsibility of complete dominion will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called the Wonderful One, Extraordinary Strategist, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. Great and vast is his dominion, and he will bring immeasurable peace and prosperity. He will rule on David's throne and over David's kingdom to establish and uphold it by promoting justice and righteousness from this time forward and forevermore. The marvelous passion that the Lord Yahweh, commander of the angel armies, has for his people will ensure that it is finished. And in some versions it says that the government will be upon his shoulders. Now hear this. In the Passion Translation, it says the responsibility of complete dominion will rest on whose shoulders? His shoulders. And his name will be. Okay. And then he goes into that. It, it's powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff that we're, that we're talking about here. The responsibility for complete dominion does not rest upon you. It rests upon God. It rests upon Him. The United States of America is under the authority of Jesus Christ no matter who wins this election.
and the Bible told uh, not the Bible but the Lord told me back in back in uh, October of last year that there was going to be a great shaking and then comes the billions souls revival I, I, I tend to think that maybe this intense shaking or this great shaking is 2020 I thought it was an earthquake but what can shake more than what's happened in 2020 globally yeah there was an earthquake in Turkey pestilence there's a bunch of stuff that's been going on God is still on the throne I woke up this morning and, and I looked and I saw that God was still on the throne he hasn't left and many people feel like and, and hear me if if whoever wins whoever is our president it's not going to usher in the tribulation nor will it usher in the millennium I remember when when um, Bill Clinton uh, won the presidency back in the 90s 90, uh, 88 rather uh, sorry 92 when he won the presidency I, I went I went down to um, Jack Hayford's church and I did a conference there and, and, and I remember we we had the conference um, was the day after or a couple of days after the um, uh, the election and Bill Clinton had won and and the first thing that Jack Hayford said was was listen the tribulation didn't start and even if a conservative won back then the millennium wouldn't have started either be careful when somebody says they know the day and the hour because Jesus didn't even know it he said only the father knows everybody's worried about when is it going to end I remember when I was saved back in the 70s one of the main teachings that was going around was that Jesus is coming back tomorrow and I remember we were with our pastor he would buy us lunch or you know we would do things together and our pastor was a great man and um, and he and you know and we were talking and one day he says Hey, you guys aren't working and we said well you know Jesus is coming back tomorrow and he said who told you that and he said well everybody had been telling us that and he goes no 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 no. you guys need to get jobs if you don't work neither shall you eat it says that in Thessalonians so we had to get jobs everybody's been looking for the coming of the Messiah uh, the second the Christians have been looking for the second coming and the Hebrews the Jews specifically looking for his first coming there was a movie the Shawshank Redemption and uh, in that movie there was a line that said you can either get busy living or get busy dying and you can wallow in the sorrow that your guy didn't win no matter who lost or who won you can wallow in the sorrow of that or you can get busy living or get busy dying you can either just forget about life or you can go for it I recommend that we just go for it a leader doesn't stop because the circumstances or the things around him are falling apart a leader keeps going with the vision and the purpose that he has your vision and your purpose hasn't changed and there are many people today there are many people that are walking around not understanding the value that they actually have they don't understand how great they really are and God is trying to tell them hey listen listen to me here you are powerful and you are valuable
self-loathing is a, should be a thing of the past for your life. You need to stop loathing how God created you and how God made you. If you're creative, be creative. If you're an artist, be an artist. If you're an animal lover, love animals. If you're a musician, be a musician. If God's given you a, the gift of talking, talk. But don't just have vain talking. Empty, empty chatter. That's not... Have something to say. Don't just talk to hear yourself talk. Have a point. And this is what God is bringing us into at this time. Now, please understand, I'm not mad at anybody. I don't have that in me. Yeah, that's a good point right there. The question says, what if uh, you were given up on for adoption and feel thrown away, which is, which is a very truthful thing. That is definitely a thing. I have a daughter that was adopted at birth. Um, my girlfriend uh, gave birth to her, thank God. And, um, and then my daughter was adopted. I had no idea until she was 16 that she was adopted. And she always had this feeling of rejection. People who are divorced have uh, that feeling as well. And here's the thing. You have to see yourself. We have to see ourselves. I'm divorced, so I mean, I, I deal with being rejected and being thrown away, uh, being I'm de devalued quite a bit. And, um, and what happens is that you have to just go and say, well, what does God think of me? And I bring you to Romans chapter 8. You know, that uh, I think it's right, right around verse 15, where he's, uh, one version says that we've been adopted as sons and, you know, we've been adopted as children. But uh, in the Passion Translation, it says, we have, we have full acceptance. God fully accepts us. See, when we're born, we, have, we are filled. We are, we are full of God. We, are, we, we have no environment of, of pain, even though a label has been placed on us. And I wrote a children's book, or it's in the process of being written. I'm just looking for illustrations, uh, called The Label-Less Can. And, and we used to have cans up in our... Um, up in our clot uh, when I was growing up in the cabinet that had no labels on them. Some of them were peas, some of them were corn, some of them, you know, um, and so we had to open them up to see what was on the inside. And so the book deals with uh, this can that's been rejected by everybody. Well, this is what you should be, and it wasn't that person. You know, it wasn't that. When you deal with those emotions, you have to understand where they came from. Because the enemy is the one that's putting his thumb on you of rejection, of self-loathing, of I've been rejected by my real mom. And I also know that some, some people are given up for adoption. It's, it's, a, it's because the mom can't take care of the baby. Some of them are given up for adoption because the mother dies in the process. And who knows where the father is? I know, I know of a friend. They're in. Um, South Jersey. And. Um, they adopted this baby. The father died at, in war. He was in Vietnam. And the father. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was post Vietnam. I can't remember what country he was killed in, but he was killed. He was shot. And uh, he'd just been sent back to his, um, you know, to his outfit. And he came home for a few weeks and um, she got pregnant. She ended up dying in the birth, you know, and during, and during the process of birth. And there was this baby. And this lady from South Jersey adopted this child. 
there are things that people, you know, that you are adopted, you know, you're, nobody really wants you. And, and that's just not true. Because the people that adopted you, they can't disinherit, they, they cannot disinherit you. In many states in the United States, there's a law that says if you adopt somebody, you cannot disinherit them. We've been grafted in, and it's a tremendous. It's like God lined us all up and said, I choose you. When you are adopted, somebody said, I choose this one. Now the foster care home, the foster home care, that's a different story. A lot of people just do it for the money. But when you adopt somebody, it's totally different. Yeah, your parents have may have rejected you. I get that, and you walk around with that. But those things don't happen at your birth. Those things are given to you afterwards. And that's the environment that you were born in, and God doesn't want that. And God has a lot to say about orphans and widows and things like that. And God is destroying, I, I believe that in the next few years, you're going to see the orphan spirit. The orphan spirit has been broken, but it's still hanging on. And God is going to destroy the orphan spirit where people feel fully accepted. I want to read that in Romans chapter 8, okay? Would that be okay with you guys? Romans chapter 8. I love Romans 8. Romans 8 is like one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. That's a good question, Kim, by the way. And he says this. And you, uh, it says, The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Verse 15. And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. And people are... And, and people always have that feeling that they're never good enough, especially in adoption. That they always have to do better than, every, than the natural children. And he says, in the fear of never being good enough. But, everybody say but. You have received the spirit of full acceptance. The, the spirit of adult or complete sonship. The Aramaic translates that as the spirit of consecrated children purposely brought in you've received that spirit of full acceptance and folding you into the family of God and you will never feel orphaned for as he rises up within us our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection beloved father so we tend to which is true we tend to look at the bad thing that happened, but we don't understand the good thing that happened. The good thing that happened was that we are now brought in as complete sons. There's a difference between just being an immature son and a complete son. And I'm, you know, I mean, that's genderless. Uh, a lot of people feel, uh, you know, feel slighted because he doesn't talk about women, but that's not true. He's talking about children, but remember that in the Jewish custom that the first that the, that the sons get the inheritance and so for the women understand that you become a son of God in the kingdom you are so to speak a son because you get the full inheritance and men don't understand what it means to be the bride and God's starting to, to share with men that you are the bride of Christ Oh, wow, I've gone really long. But this is so important because if you feel that, that you're thrown away or discarded, it's the enemy lying to you because you are not thrown away, but actually you are brought in. Now, people, you know, I, I know that some people, well, you're just a donkey. I remember how my daughter started to look for me. Uh, it was really funny. She started to look for me because... Uh, her and her mo or her and her stepmom had an argument, and her mother let it slip out. Well, you're not even my daughter. And then she spent 20 years trying to find her real parents. She found her birth mother first, who wanted nothing to do with her, and then she found me, who wants everything to do with her. Anyway, 
All right, so that's that's it for today. So just um, don't accept the lie that you're thrown away. Don't accept that lie. You're not. Actually, you are accepted. You are, um, as, as uh, I'm going to read this too. I, you know, I know I said I was going to close, but I'm not. I can talk. I want to uh, go to Isaiah chapter th- uh, 43. Isaiah 43. He says, listen. Okay? Listen to me. He's talking to Jacob here. He's talking to a nation. But put your name in that in verse 1. Listen to the one who created you. Listen to the one who shaped who you are. Do not fear, for I, your kinsman redeemer, God has redeemed you. He has bought you. He has called you by name. And listen to this. You are mine, he says. You are his. He rescued you. He has called you by name. You are his. And then he goes on. Don't fear. Don't fear it anymore. You have been chosen. He, You belong to him. He's fully accepted you. He's fully accepted me. You know, and, and, I'm, and I, I take full responsibility for my divorce. But you still have this rejected feeling. Whether you, you are the one that that's filed for divorce or the one that... You know, had to sign the papers in the end. You deal with rejection. Anyway. Okay, guys. Um, I've talked for long enough. We've worshipped. And, um, yeah, it was a great day today. Um, understand that, that we're moving forward. We're not stuck in the mud. We're going to move forward. We are going to go as the army of God. Pry, uh, prophesy into your dry bones. Prophesy into your dreams and visions. God is amazing. And, and, and just know that, that everything is being new. Everything is brand new. Okay? There, there's, there's no dirt. You were made perfectly. Uh, you can read that in, in, in Psalm 139, Jeremiah chapter 1. God formed you, Isaiah 41. <clears throat> and he cares about you and he's going to see you through this thing. Listen to me. Don't hold your head down anymore. Pick your head up. Pick your head up. And understand that God, the creator of the ends of the earth, loved you enough to choose you. You are chosen by God. Yeah, Romans 8, Isaiah 43. I mean, you can see it in Isaiah 41 as well. Understanding how carefully God created you. Understanding how carefully he's molded you. And, and, and then you can also read Romans 8, 29. Tremendous verse. Our destiny is to be made in the image of Jesus. Isn't that cool? Anyway, God bless you guys. Have a great day. Um, today is Thursday, so we'll see you again tomorrow.